All right, this is the first class of the spring semester 2021. Uh, the book of Romans, we'll start with. The book of Romans is a, a, a 16 chapters, and man, it's got a lot of information in it. Uh, a lot of great doctrines we'll look at doctrine of justification, sanctification, uh, how, important, how, how important it is to be grateful for the grace of God. Uh, it's just so much here, uh, the fellowship that we are to have with God. It was probably written around 56, 57 AD. Uh, and I, I say probably, nobody knows exactly because they didn't keep calendar like uh, we do today. Uh, they kept some calendars, but it doesn't relate to ours. And obviously, uh, I said this something last semester, uh, if you found a coin, if you went to Israel and uh, found a coin on the sidewalk or on the ground that was dated 20 BC, would that coin be valuable? And of course the answer is no. Nobody knew when BC was. So they, if it was dated 20 BC, it had to be made after Jesus was born. And so it's a fake. Because uh, you know, uh, BC is before his birth. And AD, remember, is Anna Domini, meaning in the year of the Lord. So it's, it's an educated guess based upon content of the book sometimes. Uh, it's like the book of Hebrews we know was written before 70 AD because it speaks of offering up temple sacrifices in the present tense. And the temple was destroyed in 70, so they didn't offer up uh, sacrifices there. So some books we, we, we get pretty close to when they were written. In chapter 15, it talks about the importance of raising funds for the poor believers in Jerusalem. Uh, it, the church is not a welfare station. Right? That's not the intent of the church. But does the church have responsibility to help people? Yeah, it does to, to a certain degree. Uh, you have to be so careful nowadays with that, though, who you're helping, who you're giving to. Uh, I, I believe that you definitely should pray about anything and everything that you give to. Uh, you should research anything and everything you give to to make sure that it's legitimate. I mean, and nowadays, people don't mind uh, claiming the name of Jesus at all as long as they'll get money out of it. Uh, but the church, uh, we do have a responsibility to other people, uh, for helping other people, not, not just giving them continually, keeping them on a welfare system kind of thing, but we do have responsibility to give. Uh, Book of Romans talks about the giving. Uh, this was written after Paul left Ephesus on his third missionary journey. So we know his first one started in Acts chapter 13. Uh, uh, Acts chapter 20, the third missionary journey is over with. And this semester we'll be looking at a lot of those uh, missionary journeys that Paul went on. Uh, some people even say he went on four missionary journeys. It's, it's hard to tell uh, between the third and the fourth one if it's the same one or if it's two different ones. It's not really important as to the number of missionary journeys, but it is important that he went on missionary journeys. Uh, remember in Acts chapter 13, when Paul was first called to go, uh, Acts 13, 1 talks about that the church at Antioch, there were certain disciples such as Barnabas, and goes and lists, uh, several other names at the end, and Saul. And then verse 2, uh, extremely important verse, because that verse says, uh, and the Holy Ghost told the church, said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work wherein I have called them. The important thing about that verse is the Holy Spirit calls us into the ministry. Uh, we sometimes in our church today, I know, you know church without a pastor, uh, and they just get one, with, uh, people say, well, we just called a new pastor. Uh, no, if the church called a pastor, then it's in trouble. It's not the church that does the calling. It's a church that recognizes the calling. So when Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul at the time in Acts 13, went on the first missionary journey, the uh, Holy Ghost told the church to separate Barnabas and Saul for the work wherein the Holy Spirit called them. If God calls you to do something, then he will let other people know that you're called to do it. You will recognize, be recognized. If uh, a man has been called to a pastor, that people will recognize that fact. Uh, I have a friend of mine who is not satisfied with the ministry that he's in. He is in the ministry, so he wants to be a pastor now. And he's went to 
I don't know, 30, 40 different churches trying to get them to uh, uh, hire him as pastor, and he's not getting anywhere. I don't believe God called him to do that. I, I think where he's at, people recognize where he's at. He's doing a, a good work where he's at. People see that. But for some reason now, he's dissatisfied, and he wants his own thing. <clears throat> it's a dangerous thing. Uh, you never do what God hasn't called you to do. And there's nothing wrong with not being a pastor, not being a missionary, not being a teacher. You, know, you don't have to have a title to do God's work. Uh, but let God call you. And if whatever God calls you to do, other people will recognize that call. As I always say, you know, if I told my pastor that uh, I want to sing in church next Sunday because God's called me to do that, uh, it would be very quickly they realize that God hasn't called me to do that. Because <laughs> I don't have the ability. Actually, our pastor probably would let me sing in church next Sunday because everybody else would be in the parking lot. <laughs> 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 yeah, that work. Romans chapter 1 tells us it was written to Christians at Rome. It was written predominantly to Gentiles. And we know this because of the content of the book. It's kind of, you know, Matthew uh, has 28 chapters. Mark has 16 chapters. Uh, what's the difference between Matthew and Mark? I mean, we call them uh, synoptic gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, meaning that Matthew, Mark, and Luke has a lot of similar content. But the difference between Matthew and Mark is that Matthew contains a lot of fulfilled prophecies. Mark doesn't cover the prophecies. That means that Matthew was written to Jews who knew the prophecies. Mark was written to Gentiles who did not know the prophecies. Why, would, why do you need to have something fulfilled if they don't even know what it was? And so each book is geared to different people in the early church. We know also Paul was a missionary to the Gentiles, or the apostle to the Gentiles. Right? Uh, Peter was the apostle to the Jews. He stayed in uh, Italy. Um, Italy. I saw it wrong there. He stayed in Jerusalem. Uh, there were, or in Judah, anyway. Uh, that's where his ministry was at, and where Paul would go on the missionary journeys, uh, speaking predominantly to Gentiles. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't include the, uh, speak to Jews. He did both. Even in the book of Romans, he uh, shows uh, very, in chapters 9 through 11 that are important to the Jews to show that the Jews are still, they, they can get saved today. I mean, some people have this weird philosophy that uh, God went to the Jews in the Old Testament and only Jews got saved, and now in the New Testament only Gentiles get saved. And that's obviously not true. There were Jews and Gentiles in the Old Testament, Jews and Gentiles today. Paul was a Jew. He said Matthew was written to the, one, to the Jews that knew the prophecy. Yeah. And the other one? Mark was Mark. written to Gentiles. It does have some strong Jewish elements in it. It does use uh, some of the old... Uh, a good use of the Old Testament. Not not prophecies as such, but content. The Jewish element would be stronger than in churches began by Paul, so he, it still had a purpose. I mean, his writings weren't just to his churches, to the church of Rome or what have you. It went to all people, so uh, it still had a good Jewish element. I'm amazed how many people I've run across in the years that uh, believe that uh, nobody started getting saved until after Jesus died. Uh, and so they say Old Testament, and I've heard them say Old Testament, no, no Old Testament person got saved. Uh, there's plenty of evidence of that. I mean, Elijah and uh, Moses were at the Mount of Transfiguration and talked to Jesus there. Uh, he called them out of hell to talk to him? I don't think so. Uh, so definitely there were people saved in the Old Testament. A lot of Jews were saved. Our church was mainly of Jews in the very beginning. The 3,000 in Acts chapter 2 that were added to the church were Jews. And so we, we know that their church is founded on, on them. What makes them think that there weren't any saints in the Old Testament? Because they say Jesus had to die in order for people to get saved. Absolutely. That's what that was the argument with me that, you know, salvation had not come because Jesus had not come. And it was, it was somewhat. Like uh, Abraham believed God and was imputed with righteousness. Uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty. But whether Jesus had come or not doesn't matter. The promise was that he was coming. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died for all the sins past, but guess what? He died for all the sins future, too. So, yeah, it's 
I, I don't understand that mentality, but definitely. Uh, I mean, you have uh, uh, Peter, you have Mary, you have 120 in the upper room who all got saved in the Old Testament period that were brought into the church. So, yeah, there's way, way too much evidence. Probably written from Corinth. And we see that in, in a couple of verses here. Uh, Phoebe uh, was apparently a, the one who bore the letter. Uh, our church does not have deaconesses. Uh, some church has deaconesses. And the reason they have them is they base it off of Acts chapter 16. Uh, or, excuse me, Romans 16 uh, here, when it says Phoebe is servant of God and the word servant is the word deaconess. Now, does that mean we should have deaconesses today? No. I, I'm not saying you should, but I'm not saying it's wrong to, if you do. Uh, you also have Sunday school teachers that aren't mentioned in the Bible either. So can you have an office that's not a biblical office? Yes. You have trustees not because your church necessarily wants them, but the state of North Carolina requires them to have trustees. So, uh, nothing wrong with having more offices, but it's not a biblical office as such. The important thing about Phoebe, when you use the word servant, the word deaconess there is not a noun, it's not a title. It's a verb, it's an action. She served in the church. If you have deaconesses in your church today, that means they should be serving in the church. If you have deacons, they should be serving. The word deaconess comes from word basically means a table waiter. Remember the uh, apostle uh, uh, in Acts chapter 6, the disciples there didn't have time to do all that, so they appointed deaconesses, or deacons, excuse me, to uh, 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 take care of the physical responsibilities of the church. So I don't have a problem with the title of deaconess, it's just not a biblical law. Gaius, uh, Paul's host in, in uh, verse 23, was a very prominent leader at Corinth, and so uh, Paul uh, talk, speaks to them as well. So, th again, it's not extremely important, but for the history of the Bible, these are things are they do matter. Uh, if they didn't, God wouldn't put them in the Bible for us to, to, to research and find. Doug. Hugging it a little bit. It's hard oh. to see the yeah. corner of the screen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Yeah. Is it worse? Can you, can, you, can you put that back one second, please? One second. Anything else? <laughs> The church at Rome was not founded by an apostle. Um, it wasn't founded by Paul on the missionary journey or Peter or any of the others. It was founded uh, by Jews who left Jerusalem after Pentecost. Remember, it said a while ago in Acts chapter 2, uh, it says there are certain devout Jews from every nation, and it lists 15 different nations uh, in Acts chapter 2 that all attended the Passover. Uh, on uh, me, the Feast of Pentecost there uh, in the New Testament and when the church began Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit began indwelling people at that point um, then those Jews who heard the message of Peter and believed they then went home some went back to uh, uh, whatever country Babylon, some went to uh, Egypt, some went to what, where have you and some went to Rome. 
And those Jews who went to Rome then started a church. Pretty good sized church in the beginning that fell under great persecution as well. The story of the Roman catacombs, uh, where many of the Christians hid during the persecution. Of course, we all know the story of the Colosseum, Christians that were put to death there. I know our society today, the world today, is in an upheaval and we see all the things going on politically or COVID or what have you. Uh, and it's discouraging to a certain degree, but the world has been a whole lot worse shape than it is today. A whole lot worse. I mean, can you imagine every day wondering whether or not you'll be fed to the lines as a Christian? Uh, whether you have a place that you can go to worship still yet today. And maybe we might lose those things. But if we do, God's still in control. You know, the church has always prospered when they were persecuted. And it's always fell apart during times of prosperity. And maybe that's what we need today. Maybe what's going on today is a blessing. I don't know. You know, that will be seen down the road. But nevertheless, we can use it to our advantage of knowing that God's in control no matter what happens, he's still in control politically or disease or what have you, God's still in control and you know, whether we live or whether we die you know, well, we die, but we're with the Lord because not, not a bad deal there. You remember the as I always say, with that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, the worst thing that could ever happen to them about the fiery furnace is exactly what happened the very worst thing is exactly what happened. They lived. If they died, they'd been with the Lord. Well, I mean, you know, we look on that in sorrow, but that, the believer doesn't. I mean, uh, Levi passed away last semester. Uh, he's not complaining about that. It says in Romans 15, 20, Yet, yea, so I, have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. This is a really important verse that should be utilized today. Winston-Salem, and I'm not saying it's wrong to start a church. You know, you know, a person does what God has called them to do. But I wonder sometimes, I mean, I know uh, of a uh, shopping, an old shopping center now, and the, uh, there's like four churches in the same building. I mean, it's all a strip mall, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But there's four different churches in there. You, know, you can get mad three times and never have to move your car. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, others downtown, I mean, you can throw a rock and hit three other churches where you're at. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's places, counties, that don't have any Bible believing church whatsoever. I, I think too many times people want to build up on another man's foundation. They, they'd rather stay where they're at. Remember Acts 1 8? Acts 1 8 says, God told, says, and you shall be witness unto me, where both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utmost part of the earth. Did they go? On the, did they spread out like God told them to in Acts 1 8? No. What did it take to get them spread out? We, you, take, you take Acts 1 8, and reverse those numbers to 8 1. You go to chapter 8, verse 1, and it says, and they, uh, God allowed persecution, and they were scattered abroad throughout Judea, uh, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and uh, other most part. So God told them to go in Acts 1-8. They refused to go, so God sent persecution to, to get them to go. Well, again, sometimes maybe that's what we need today to get us going a little bit. The problems to get us trusting Him again. You don't have to write this down. I'll write this. I'll print this out for you. There's a lot of stuff here, and it's not something I feel like you have to memorize or what have you. But it is interesting to note uh, the history of the Book of Romans and what it has caused throughout history. One is uh, Augustine. Now, Augustine was a Catholic, but there's some is some evidence of his salvation. Martin Luther was a Catholic as well, 
and stayed Catholic his whole life. He didn't want to leave Catholicism. He thought Catholicism was the only way to go, but he realized that their idea of salvation was wrong. And so it was when he was reading Romans, uh, the just shall live by faith. Remember, he was raised in a belief that, in fact, his room, they, if it's, history is accurate, the uh, museum is accurate, they say his, his room was a small space, not much bigger than this here. It had a bed on it and a whip on the wall. And every night, he would go in and he would beat himself until he passed out. Because he was told by the Catholic Church that if you want to go to heaven, you have to suffer. And so they taught him to do that. Well, when Paul was reading the just shall live by faith, he found it back at the Romans, and he realized that it wasn't by works, that it was by God's grace. And that's when his transformation started, and what we call the Protestant Reformation began at that point. He wanted to go back and have the church and get them to understand that. They, they wouldn't listen to him. Uh, John Wesley, you know who John Wesley is, a, a founder of uh, Methodism uh, in the United States, him and Francis Asbury, and Charles Wesley, his brother, a great hymn writer. Uh, but he was actually went by a Mennonite meeting in London and heard them uh, preaching from Romans, and he got saved. He had already been a missionary to this country before that happened. He was sent here by the Anglican Church to be a missionary, and he left to go back home. When he went back home, he got saved, and then he came back again uh, to actually preach the truth. Uh, again, you don't have to write this. I'll print this out. Uh, it'll just be, it's just a list of when the books of the Bible, we believe, were written. Very important is the purpose of the book of Romans. One was an appeal for help. Uh, not just financially. We tend to think when you hear a missionary speak that he's just asking for money. but also for others to follow, others to be used. But we all need help in the ministry. You know? uh, no man liveth in himself, no man dies into himself. Uh, it is important that we work with one another. Uh, it's important that when you pray, and I've mentioned this many times, and I, hopefully I'll always remember to mention this, that when you pray, instead of just asking God to give you an answer to prayer, ask God to make you an answer to somebody else's prayer. And ask God to use you. you know, because when God answers prayer in your life, if you have a financial need and God answers prayer, He does so not by suddenly a thousand dollars appears on the table, but He does so by giving you a work or, or laying on somebody's heart or what have you. He uses people to do that. We should be willing to be used more than we even ask. When we have a need, that's fine. Ask God to fulfill that need. But even more so should we ask to be used by God. The Mediterranean work was completed, and that means the missionary journeys of Paul were completed at this uh, point in time. There was problems between the Jews and Gentiles. Uh, Judaizers, remember, we have to talk about in other classes, but a Judaizer was a Jew who went into the early church uh, and maybe wasn't even saved in the first place. Just said they converted to Christianity. And more than likely, that is exactly what happened. Uh, and they brought with them their old way of life and told people that if you truly want to be saved, then first of all, some, would even, some of the Jews would say, in order to be saved, first and foremost, you have to be a Jew because they believe only Jews can get saved. Some would say, no, you have to convert to Judaism. Uh, but you have to follow the, the laws. And, of course, that's not what the Bible teaches. So uh, many of these Judaizers came to the early church to confuse the church and stir problems, and they well did. Remember, in Acts 15, they had a council in Jerusalem over that very thing because so many of them felt like you have to be a Jew, you have to be circumcised, you have to do this. Just like today's people would say you have to be baptized in order to get saved, and you have to... Uh, repent of all your sin. Boy, there's a good one. Imagine if you had to repent of all your sin in order for you to be saved. Nobody would be saved. Do you remember everything you did when you were seven years old? I guarantee one of them was sin. <laughs> and Paul also wanted to introduce himself to the church at Rome. Paul had opposition 
from others. Even true believers, some of the Jews, felt like, well, maybe you do have to be a Jew to be born to be saved. They, they were ignorant. Remember, uh, in Acts chapter 8, they uh, ran across a man by the name of Simon. The Bible calls him Simon the Sorcerer. And the Bible says that Simon believed and that he followed others in believers' baptism as well. But when uh, Peter showed up and they were speaking in other languages, Simon asked if he could buy the power of the Holy Spirit. And Peter rebuked him. Now, was Simon saved? Yes. Was it a right thing to do? No. He was ignorant of the things of God. And he was sharply rebuked for it, and there's all types of evidence that he was saved. I and mean, you go through that verse, verses, and there's all types of evidence. He was saved, he just didn't know. Some people in our church are ignorant, and they go with others who cause problems. Some in our church are willful, they know that it's wrong, and they do it anyway. Like every time I've ever seen anybody get mad and leave the church, they never went by themselves. They always had to take somebody with them to justify them to their own self. Yeah. Paul was opposed by insincere Jews, as the Judaizers were talking about, by some Gentiles who tried to merge the gospel with their theories or philosophies. For example, Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism. Uh, we, the word Gnosticism means knowledge. You know, an agnostic today means a person with no knowledge. You know, but in that, the actual definition of agnostic is one who thinks there could be a God, we, just, we don't know. That's what, an atheist says there's no God. Agnostic says there could be, but I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, but Gnosticism means knowledge. And this is one of the great problems. It's even in the church today. I'm a dispensationalist. And by that, I mean, I believe that God acted in different ways throughout history. I believe that with Adam and Eve, God worked with them in one way that, by speaking to them. Under the law, I believe that the Jews had to follow the, strive to follow the 613 Old Testament laws uh, and to offer up sacrifices. When the church began, we no longer have to offer up sacrifices. I see throughout history, different times, God worked in different ways. Some through the conscience before the written word, some after the written word of the Old Testament, and then the church today. So I can see a clear difference. There are some who today do not dispensationalists uh, who believe in some really weird things. And they, they pride themselves. Um, some believe in, in what's called Calvinism. Or, uh, some will say hyper-Calvinism. I, I don't, Calvinism and hyper-Calvinism the same thing. And that is, they believe that God has only selected certain people for salvation, and he selected others for hell. And that's not in my Bible. Uh, they believe that all prophecy is uh, figurative. So if the Bible talks about a millennial kingdom, it doesn't mean that. It means whatever they want it to mean. I, I don't agree with that. And, but they pride themselves on knowledge. They, they, they think of themselves as academics. And they feel like they're superior to everybody else because they know and you don't know. <coughs> what happened in the early church? In fact, one of the uh, uh, quotes we have from a, a, a man by the name of Marcion in the early church, he wrote that he felt like it was his responsibility to correct the scriptures where the scriptures be corrected. In other words, he thought he was smarter than God. God messed up, so he said, my job to correct them. Well, this was very much so in the early church, and we see it in a lot of churches today. A lot of uh, churches are, tend to be more academic than they are practical. It's only about education. I know of a church here in town that they pride themselves in that and, and will even say, well, we're not an evangelistic church. We're a teaching church. Well, God's called every single person to evangelize. It, it, should the church be a teaching church? Yes. And that's the problem with some churches that they don't teach anything. You know, it's just emotion. But yes, we should teach, but we all have to witness as well. And so Paul had to deal with all these different philosophies in, in the early churches. The first section of the book of Romans, and we'll get more into different verses next week, but the first section is the theme of the righteousness of God. There's a big teaching.
teaching today that's going on in politics and elsewhere, talking about science. That uh, if you don't follow, believe in science, then basically you're an idiot. It's, it's, and they, they use it with uh, climate change. I can't remember the, the current name for it, because it's going to change. Uh, you know, when I was in school, they talked about the next ice age was coming very, very soon. Uh, then they talked about uh, the uh, hole in the ozone layer. Remember that one? Uh, acid rain. Remember that? That's going to kill everybody, too. Mm -hmm. Then climate, uh, uh, global warming, and now climate change. And they say, if you don't believe in these things, then you're stupid. Well, I believe in climate change. I, I, I do. I, I can't imagine. When I was born, the Earth had 3.5 billion people on it. Now it's 7.5 billion. I imagine that's one affect it. Uh, the earth in some ways, but also believe that God can control everything. So I don't have any problem with that. Man is not going to destroy this earth. We know exactly what's going to happen to this earth. Uh, but they say if you don't believe science, then you're, you're stupid. I do believe science. I believe science 100%. I agree with every single thing that science proves. I don't agree with a lot of so-called scientists because they don't prove anything. You know, they don't believe in creation. I do. I believe God created the earth in six literal 24-hour days. I have no problem with that whatsoever. And they say, well, but you have to be more educated. No, I believe in, and I think science actually would, would prove that if they wanted to see it. Uh, the righteousness of God here, you know, I, I believe God. I believe His Word. I believe I can hold up His Word today and say I have the inspired and inerrant infallible Word of God because of preservation. I don't think you... People say just the original manuscripts of the Bible were inspired by God. If that's true, we're all in trouble because nobody has the original manuscripts. What good is it to say they were and we don't have it today? Preservation takes care of all that. Does that mean there can't be mistakes in your Bible? Spelling? I had a Bible that said in Luke chapter 2 that when Jesus was born, they laid him in a manger. <laughs> Y'all thought it was a manger all that time. I'm correct if I was saying. Uh, yeah, there'd be typos. It doesn't take away from the Word of God. I had a Bible, uh, uh, Criswell Study Bible, it was uh, talking about odals in the Old Testament. Several times we were talking about these odals that you should not bow down to odals. Uh, misspelled words. Hey, do I, does that take away from the uh, Word of God? No. No. If it did, everybody would change, the devil would change every word. No, God preserves it. Therefore, we have the word of God as intended. I'm going to use that concept of idolizing. Yeah. <laughs> Second section of the book of Romans, chapter 1, 18 through 5, 11, is the imputation of righteousness. Imputation is a great doctrine of the Bible. It's a legal act whereby God declares the sinner righteous. I'll have that written down later on. I said. The definition, but imputation is if I were to stand before God right now, but right before Him, I would stand before Him as 100% righteous. God sees me right now as righteous. Now, I don't feel like I'm righteous because I'm not in many ways, but God sees me then. Why? Because it's not my righteousness, it's the imputation of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So, you don't have to worry about it. Paul elaborates on the sinfulness of humanity, which we use the book of Romans in evangelizing the world today. Probably the most used passages to lead somebody to the Lord are found in the book of Romans, what many will call the Romans Road. All of sin. I'm sure the Lord God is no righteous now. What the world needs today is the same thing you needed in Paul's day, and that is the righteousness of God. It's our job to tell people, to encourage them. No politicians will come along and fix this world for us. I don't care what party you're affiliated with or not affiliated. Not what happened. 
you know, I was with you, I kind of envy the Jehovah's Witnesses on this one, because they don't think you should have anything to do with politics. <laughs> I'm kind of thinking, mm, they, might, they might have it right. Third section is the, uh, the imputation of righteousness and the impartation of righteousness. We'll look at the imparting of the imputation. The Bible talks about Abraham in three different ways in the Bible. But it says Abraham believed God and it was imparted into righteousness. He believed God and it was imputed into righteousness. He believed God and it was accounted into righteousness. Actually, four. He believed God and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Um, that's a really, really great passage. The imputation of Jesus' righteousness. The word imputing means to place, you know, to place on somebody's account. It'd be like saying that, uh, and this is not going to happen, this is just for illustrative purposes only, but uh, Robin, do you have a credit card? Yeah. yeah. Being me, like going to your bank and saying, Robin has a credit card here, and I want to 100% pay your credit card off. That'd be great. I don't know about your credit card, but it'd be great for ours mm -hmm. you know, yeah. to, to pay it off. Now, this, again, it's just illustration, it's not going to happen. Okay. <laughs> uh, but that would be great if somebody just completely paid off all your debt. But the word goes further than that. Then I would say, I don't want her to charge anything else to this card. But if she does, I'll pay for it too. Well, see, it's when Jesus' rights is imputed to our account, he forgave us every sin that we ever committed, completely debt-free. He doesn't want you to sin anymore. But if you do, the blood's covered that as well. So, and that's not giving an excuse to sin, saying, no, it's okay because it's already covered. But it is the fact that God has not a forgiveness of everything, everything in the past, but everything in the future is forgiven as well. Third section, Paul deals with these three doctrines justification, sanctification, and glorification. We'll look throughout the semester on these doctrines. Justification, we're saved from the penalty of sin. The Old Testament contained 613 laws that the Jews were required to, to keep. If a person in the Old Testament could keep every single one of those laws, let's just say that they could, they keep every one of those laws their whole life. When they died, where would they go? Yeah. It's so good to help. Because the law can't save them. Those laws were not to give them salvation. Those laws were to point out sin. To show them they were sinners. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Not by works of righteousness. I heard a, a, a very renowned preacher several years ago uh, had the world's largest Sunday school class, 26,000 in Sunday school class. 26,000. And in his later years, I don't know if he got dementia, I don't know. Uh, but in his later years, he, he always talked about growing up that he had an alcoholic father who abused him all the time and had a godly mother. He made the statement, uh, not too long before he died, this preacher did, that he believed that his father would be in heaven. Because of all the works he said that I've done, surely God would allow me to be in heaven. The guy never taught that before. He never preached that. I don't know if his mind went or what, but I, it doesn't matter how, how great you are. 
uh, I, I, honestly, Billy Graham has to be more responsible for people to come to the Lord than any other single person in history. I mean, whether you agree with him or don't agree with what he did, he did give the plan of salvation. He did have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people come to know the Lord because of his invitation. Didn't get him any closer to God. Well, you know, the soul winner's crown, what we call the soul winner's crown. Will he have the, the greatest soul winner's crown than anybody else? Not necessarily. If God has only put five people in your path in your lifetime and you lead them to the Lord, you've done just as much as Billy Graham's done. Because it's not the numbers, it's by the obedience to God. That's why when you don't lead somebody to the Lord, I know if I don't, I, when I first got saved, I went with the scene throughout this neighborhood, probably a half mile circumference of this church, knocked on every single door and tried to leave people to the Lord. And not one time did I ever leave anybody to the Lord. And I'd go back uh, home and I'd, I'd literally in tears at times, feeling like such a failure that I, I don't know what, maybe God doesn't, doesn't want to use me, maybe God can't use me, maybe, I don't know. And I felt like such a failure because I never led anybody to the Lord. And it was a long time down the road before I realized that God holds me responsible for faithfulness, not for success. It's not how many people you lead to the Lord. It's not the numbers that you gain. It's your obedience to God. You just do what God wants you to do. If they get saved, praise God. If they don't get saved, then you still pray for them, but praise God. You did what God wanted you to do. That's what, that's what matters. Sanctification is uh, salvation from the power of sin. Remember the word sanctification, I, always illustrate it this way because when people get saved today and sanctification is a word we use a lot in our church today but we call it separation uh, and it's okay separation is, is not a bad term for it but many people get saved and they feel like now that I'm saved I need to separate myself from the world and so they, they get saved and they move away from maybe their friends that were leading them astray from drugs or whatever it might be from all the sins and they get it over here, and throughout their Christian life, they talk about, well, I don't do this anymore, and I don't do that, and I don't go there, and I don't say these things, and I, bless God, I just don't do anything anymore. You know, and they're proud of the fact that they don't go to those places, and they don't sin. And that's good that they don't do those things, but that's not, that's not where God wants us. When we separate from the world, we're not to come over here just to separate from the world, but we're more important, we're to separate unto the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sanctification is to separate from the world unto God. And so instead of staying here and realizing, saying, I don't do this and I don't do that, we move over here to the things of God and our whole life consumed with what I do, not what I don't do. This is what I do. I read my Bible. I pray. I witness. I, I go to church. I fellowship. I encourage. I uh, you know, have this ministry. I have that ministry. And I've got all these things that I have to do. Because if you're over here, over here, your mindset is things of the world, even though you don't do them anymore, but you're thinking about that. Yeah, I don't go to this place anymore, but you know, before I go there, I, <laughs> I used to go here, I used to go there, and when we had to go, but you're not going to say, so I don't do those things anymore. And almost looking back on it, you know, with some fondness. But over here, it doesn't matter about drugs, it doesn't matter about whatever. Over here, you concentrate on things of God. You're not thinking about those things. Remember the Bible tells us what several things are true, just, holy, pure, lovely, good, important, being a virtue, being praised to think on these things. And so I'm thinking on the things of God. I'm not worried about what I didn't do. I've got a ministry that I'm working on, so if I want to teach, I need to make, prepare my heart. If I'm going to go on a missionary trip, i got to prepare. i got to get that focus. I'm going to teach Sunday school next Sunday. i, I got to get ready. So my whole life is surrounded by things that I'm doing, not what I'm not doing. I mean, you know, in order for a person to quit smoking, what's the best way to quit smoking? Stop smoking. Hmm? Just stop. Don't smoke the next cigarette. <laughs> to start something else. To start oh, something, replace it. Oh, okay. It you know, to quit drinking, to replace it, to quit whatever, to replace with something else. Well, I did that and I gained 100 pounds. <laughs> I, I replaced yeah. my cigarette with... Uh, with peppermint candy. Uh, so there's a lot of peppermint candy. That's a lot of peppermint. But you never smoked anymore. Yeah. I don't. But, 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 you, but you replace it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Instead, not worry about not what I'm not doing or what worrying about the, the I'm not doing this. I got too many things I got to do. I got. You know, I don't have time to to do this because I got to get ready for next Sunday or I got to get this done. I got to get that. Done. I got to call this person witness to me. 
our whole life consumed. Therefore, we think about things of God. We think about the true, just, lovely, pure, lovely, good, important, of the way that the verse is. Uh, but our mind is on the mind of God. Glorification, salvation from the presence of sin. We haven't hit that yet, as you may realize. Uh, I wish we had. I mean, I, there are times, and God laughs at me, and I really believe He does every time I say it, because I sit, still say it, and I know it's stupid. God's not going to do it. But I say, Lord, just make it so I can't sin anymore. And God says, I'm not going to do that. He said, because that will come at the rapture of the church in a moment, twinkling an eye, it shall all be changed, and that's when we will be glorified. We will not have a body that doesn't sin anymore. That is what I'm looking forward to. But right now, God says, if you serve me, you serve me by your will, not by my force. And so God's not forcing you to serve, but he's giving his opportunity to do that. The fourth section regards uh, questions about Israel. If God is so righteous, whoops, uh, how can he give Israel so many privileges with the attitude of the people in this day? Why did God choose Israel in the Old Testament? Malachi says, Jacob had a loved and Esau had a hated. He's not talking about those two individuals. He's not talking about the man Jacob and the man uh, Esau. How do we know that? Because Malachi goes on to say about Esau, and his mountains have I laid to, to waste. He's talking about Edom. He's talking about Israel and Edom. Why did God love Israel and hate Edom. Because Israel followed God, Edom did not follow God. He's not hating the individual, but he's hating the works. He's hating the sin. So when God says, I love one thing, hate it, God doesn't hate any individual. It's God loves every single person in this world just the same, no matter who they are, who they were. But he hates the sin. So many of think, well, Israel had, was privileged in the Old Testament. It was Israel's job in the Old Testament to do what God has called the church now to do. The church is called to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It says even to the uttermost part of the earth. Not the parts, but the uttermost part. I mean, very, every single part. God sent us in. Is the church doing that today? No. God called Israel to do that in the Old Testament. Did they do that? No. They got very prideful. They got so prideful they thought that only the Jews could go to heaven and all Gentiles had to go to hell. It was their job to go into all the world. They failed in their responsibility. And God said, we'll look in chapter 9 through 11, but we'll uh, see that God says, I cut them off and crafted in the Gentiles. But if the Gentiles don't do their job, they can be cut off as well. If you look at church history, not just biblical church history, but the church from 100 to today, and you look at different nations today, in the 1500s, there was a group of people in France called the Huguenots, uh, French Huguenots, typically called. They were a group of believers that were so strong in their faith that it affected all of France. So much so that it, France benefited from it because they believed as Christian they were to work hard and they did work hard and they made a huge difference in France. But the queen did not like the leader of the Huguenots. His name was Admiral Colony. So she attempted to have him assassinated. He didn't die, but he was in her room and she later sent soldiers in who uh, grabbed him and threw him out the window. That began what's called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which, I think it's, my numbers are right, 20,000 people were killed in that one day. And they blocked the city streets with the bodies so people couldn't escape. And they killed so many people. That's when many of the French Huguenots left France and moved to England. 
when the Christians left France, France went way downhill. Several years ago, they said that in France today, there's only four Bible-believing churches in France. There was a lot of other churches, a lot of other religions, but as far as Bible-believing, there's four. I had a friend of mine who was a missionary over there. Uh, England began to greatly prosper because all this influx of these Christians into their society. But as they grew, the church became more powerful. When Henry VIII started his own church, the Church of England, uh, Episcopal Church today in, in this country, uh, it, it started mixing the world with Christianity and they started faltering and they started persecuting believers and they forced out the, the Puritans, what we call Puritans, and Separatists, two different groups of believers in England at the time. Puritans believed that they could stay in the Church of England and fix it. They could purify it. Separatists said, nope, we've gone too far, we need to get out. Well, those groups came to this country, and when they came to this country, they left England without the Christian witness, and they went drastically downhill. It was said at one time that the sun never sets on England. Why? Because they owned Australia, Canada, uh, Africa, India. I mean, they basically controlled the whole world. What do they control today? Uh, a country that's not much bigger than North Carolina, really. I mean, they, they, nothing at all. They're not a powerful nation anymore. Uh, why? Because I believe they kicked out Christianity. When this country is kicking out Christianity, and I think we're on that path, then this country is going to go downhill, and it could be wiped out completely. Yep. A hundred years from now, people may not even real, remember there was an America. It can go away. When people reject God, that's exactly what happens. Well, let's take a break.